Hi, everybody, and welcome to the first of our sessions in our Threat Intelligence Foundation series. I'm Paul Jaramillo, Director of Threat Hunting and Intelligence for Sophos. And a little bit about who we are. So we are Sophos, and uh, we have about 600,000 customers. And most notably, we recently made the uh, Gartner Magic Quadrant for Endpoint for 10 years in a row. And the part of the business that I work in is our managed managed detection response uh, function, which supports over 25,000 customers and growing every quarter. So what we're going to talk about today is, you know, what is threat intelligence and defining that for people that may have not had a lot of exposure to that. And maybe they hear it as a buzzword. And what exactly is it and how does it work? What are the benefits of threat intelligence? And also, what are some of the current challenges that uh, customers may face if they try to build it on their own or if they subscribe to a threat intelligence service? And also, maybe how give you some examples of how Sophos uses it to protect our customers and what are some of the outputs or deliverables from our threat intelligence capabilities. So with that, we are going to dive in. So when we break it down in terms of threat intelligence it's really three or it's really two words here so we've got threat and intelligence and probably the most confusing things is threat so a lot of people tend to confuse threat with being the malware or the tool as as that's what they typically are going to see on their endpoint or see alerts for is the malware itself but we actually refer to the threat as the adversary or the threat actor or the threat group. Those are kind of used in interchangeably amongst the threat intelligence community. And it's really the people that have the uh, motive and the capability and the intent to harm your business, whether that's to disrupt you with ransomware or to steal your intellectual property. And that's who we try to track and who we're most concerned with is the threat. And now on the other part of the equation, the intelligence part of that, you know, threat is more the goal than intelligence is the the outcome that we're looking for. So we always strive to make intelligence actionable, but it doesn't have to be always actionable. Sometimes intelligence is really potentially actionable. So it sets you up to make a better decision in the future. And so that's what I refer to as decision advantage. So intelligence uh, may be more about telling you what's occurring in the threat landscape and what are some of the threats targeting your specific sector. And knowing that in advance prepares you for having to make a decision um, at like where to make your investments, your limited budget, where should you be spending your money on what controls. Threat intelligence can inform that. And a couple of components of threat intelligence, there's a producer and a consumer. So there's the producer sometimes can be a third party producing intelligence or your internal team, but you really need a consumer. So without a consumer, there's not a lot of benefit to having threat intelligence. And the consumer is the person that's going to receive that intelligence and uh, take action from it or make decisions based off of it. And that's primarily where I've seen a lot of um, organizations focus on two types of threat intelligence, tactical versus strategic. Tactical is going to be more at the lower level, worrying about um, blocking indicators or um, specific preventions versus strategic is a much larger one. And that's for typically where you see um, the consumer not necessarily ready for strategic intelligence at a lot of organizations. Um, and then in terms of like the life cycle of intelligence, that's an important concept as well. When you're working through intelligence, you know, you always start with a plan is what, what are you trying to achieve? What's your goal with your with your um, intelligence program? So we, before you start to produce it, speak with your consumer. What are they looking for? What kind of types of information would they find useful? Once you've got that established, then you can start to collect that data, establish different collection routines process that data so turn it into something usable normally that would entail pulling it into some type of tip which is a uh, threat intelligence platform to hold all of that data and then do analysis and production and that's another session that we'll be diving into next to give you a little bit more insight into that and then lastly dissemination feedback which is really where you get the benefit so you can have all the intelligence in the world but if you're not sharing it uh, then it's not of any value and then obviously you want to get feedback and then feed that back into your planning cycle to see where there's opportunities for improvement. So a little bit of the benefits of threat intelligence. So clearly one of the, you know, 
best case scenarios is that it's an opportunity for prevention. So if you were able to get ahead of the threat and potentially prevent something because of your intelligence program, that's the biggest win you could potentially get. And so that's what everybody should be striving for. Not always realistic, you know, but it's definitely a goal. And in some cases it can be achieved. Um, and then probably on the more tactical side, which is where most, most organizations tend to focus their time, you really want to, to improve your incident response and reduce your organizational impact. And that's one of our primary goals with SOFOS MDR threat intelligence is to augment our incident response with intelligence in terms of what they should be looking for, what the threat actor likes to do, what are their tactics. And then the sooner we can disrupt that incident, the less impact there is for that customer, or that organization. It also feeds deeply into detections. So preventions, blocks, detections, all the same. So we want to feed that in threat intelligence as the adversary changes their techniques and tactics and what they're doing, that then causes you to then update what you were looking for in the past to detect whatever the newest threat is that's coming your way. Uh, a huge thing that often goes unlooked though is using threat intelligence to guide where you make your security investment. For example, if you're consistently being hit with phishing attacks or kind of access-based attacks, multi-factored access, I always recommend that. It's a great control, um, but it's something that, you know, if you see that, your threat intelligence is telling you that the types of threats that are targeting your sector, your vertical, your peers in the industry, um, are relying on brute force or single factor access, multi-factor access is something that can potentially help you. Obviously, there's more awareness and context and decision making. And that's where I mentioned earlier about potentially uh, actionable. And so having more context about specific threats definitely helps you when you have to make a decision about that. And then lastly, it's always great if you can coordinate with law enforcement and government partners, if you're able to share intelligence from your incidents, or if you're able to collect some new intelligence that potentially they may not have, sharing it is a great way to help benefit the entire community. And it's definitely played a factor in some of the large disruptions that we've seen over the last, you know, three to five years of some of these um, e-crime groups that are um, running rapid right now. So, as you may have heard, threat intelligence isn't necessarily cheap or easy. So some of the challenges with threat intelligence, um, the biggest one right off the bat is there's potentially so much more data than you can reasonably analyze. So you're able to collect much, much more than you could have an analyst go through and analyze. And that includes having machines and automation. There's just always more than you can do. So you have to have a, a very um good focus on prioritizing what matters most to your organizations to spend your time your limited resources your limited human resources on analyzing the, the threats that are most applicable to you uh, the biggest probably one of the biggest complaints you hear is the indicators lack context so um, nothing more frustrating than having your SOC or your security people chase ip addresses that maybe were bad for one or two weeks but Three months later, not so much. They're maybe a cloud hosted IP or they've moved on and no longer hosting malicious content. So having the context of when that indicator was being used and for what, how it was being used uh, is huge and can save you a lot of time where you don't chase, um, chase indicators that have lost their value. Uh, another challenge uh, is that some um, less mature organizations are simply just repackaging Intel and there can't, there's not a tremendous amount of value there. Now there is some awareness value with repackaging of intelligence, but at the end of the day, um, that's something that, you know, just subscribing to some newsletters and, and a, uh, maybe a feed or two that could serve as that function without requiring a person who is simply just repackaging. And that kind of leads into the different types of intelligence. So there's a general intelligence and tailored intelligence. So general is just going to be exactly that, just intelligence that's applicable to any organization or potentially not your sector, your geo uh, geography. 
Tailored intelligence is much, much more expensive. It's tailored to your org, very difficult to do. Hence, uh, a lot of organizations that sell threat intelligence are tending to share, to sell a share of an analyst uh, to be able to deliver that service, but it's very difficult to do. Um, and then I touched on this a little bit earlier, but the biggest challenge for a lot of organizations is just getting buy-in from leadership. Leadership needs to know what threat intelligence is and how they might use it. Otherwise, it ends up just being a wasted effort. So how does Sophos threat intelligence protect customers? So we are hunting our global telemetry of you know 600,000 customers looking for all this threat actor activity that may go undetected. Certainly the vast majority of it is blocked and protected on our endpoints and our firewalls. However, we're always looking for that telemetry because that threat actors are able to test and figure out ways to get around things. We uh, also are tracking for known threat groups and seeing how they may be changing things. We actually offer an early warning service that helps customers uh, that have endpoints that maybe don't have managed detection and let them know if we feel like there's something maybe happening in their environment uh, that they should take a look at, something more critical. We also offer Intellix as a way to submit um, unknown binaries for analysis and so folks can take a look at them. And lastly, um, from all this intelligence, obviously one of the biggest outputs is updating our protections and our detections and getting those across Sophos products so we can more rapidly protect against emerging threats. So what exactly are some of these deliverables uh, that, you know, concrete outputs from our threat intelligence efforts? So direct operational support, like I said earlier, working with IR teams and our rapid response consultants and supporting them as they're responding to these incidents. Uh, we provide inputs right back into our threat hunting as well as our detection so they can use that, whatever that new intelligence is, they can use that to either go look for it or to block it. Uh, we do spend a fair amount of time enriching incidents. So as incidents come in, it's not necessarily obvious that maybe they're related. And that's something that we'll go in in our next session to figure out exactly how we do that. We try to provide high value indicators, so observables that actually have context. So when was it used and how was it used? Without that, it's very much uh, can be a wasted effort or waste analyst time by chasing down indicators. We are also tracking campaigns and threat actors, and we deliver RFIs primarily to internal, but occasionally to customers um, when they are asking for support with a very specific threat actor campaign. We do uh, look at doing broadcast or even blogs that you may see on our XOP channel for emerging threats. So threats that are typically broadcasting or threats that are so large that they're impacting the industry wide. I think the latest one at this point that we've spent effort on was the screen connect vulnerabilities and exploitation. We also provide internal and external briefings and webinars, uh, something like this for training purposes, but also more specific briefings on specific threats. And then we do spend a fair amount of time working with different government and industry partnerships and make sure that we're able to share that information more broadly and with our peer groups. And um, we'll do a quick little plug because this is a series and we hope that you're going to provide it valuable in some of the future sessions that we have, analysis and threat clustering, malware analysis, how we're tracking infrastructure, a little bit about our cybercrime ecosystem, which is definitely on the for, uh, forefront of most of our businesses' minds. You know, how do we stop them from ransom ransomwareing or encrypting their data or potentially selling their data? And then we'll wrap up with a focus on geopolitics and geopolitics and nation states and how the more kind of well-funded nation states are targeting different organizations for intellectual property or for espionage. And with that, we will wrap up this first session and I hope you enjoyed it. If so, please like and subscribe and look forward to our next one. Thank you very much.